In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin council, uh, the very body that had condemned Jesus to death uh, on pretty much the same charges of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and, uh, I beg your pardon, blasphemy against God and against the temple. And uh, Stephen begins his defense by giving a, a history of the children of Israel. And he especially focuses in on how Israel was uh, rejected God and his messengers. And he says in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 37, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for your prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness when the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands." Israel had a problem with idols. I think anyone who has a casual reading of the Old Testament can tell that. Israel had a problem with idols. And Stephen is focusing on this. But notice what he says. He says that in their hearts, they turn back to Egypt. On one level, this seems very strange because God has just, with a, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, taken them out of Egypt, taken them out of slavery and bondage and tyranny. Uh, he, they've seen the mighty works of his hands. They've seen the, the plagues that came down on Egypt. They plundered the Egyptians, and now they're being led through the wilderness to the promised land. They saw the gifts of God. They saw the power of God, and yet they still wanted to go back to Egypt. But from another point of view, perhaps it's not so surprising. Because don't we do that sometimes? Don't we do that sometimes? We look back on our lives of sin and uh, wish that God wasn't so restrictive. Sometimes we think, that righteousness is a burden and not a blessing. Well, that's idolatrous thinking. It's idolatrous thinking. And it, Stephen says that they rejoiced in the works of their own hands. They made this calf that they were very proud of. They were very happy about it. They bowed down to it and worshipped it. And don't we do that sometimes? We rejoice in the works of our own hands. We're busy living the American dream, building lives for ourselves. Uh, we want to stand on our own two feet. And uh, work is so important. We, we need to provide for our families and our loved ones, but we can't let that be an idol. We can't rejoice in the work of our hands. Now, sometimes uh, it's our possessions that we're rejoicing in. We're, we're accumulating wealth for ourselves, and, and we're enjoying that. And sometimes we rejoice in that too much, and we forget who gave it to us. It's not really the works of our own hands. God has given us all that we have. Maybe it's our education or our kids' education. We put that before the work of the Lord sometimes, and uh, we, we can't be as involved as we want to in uh, coming to services or going to meetings or, or doing things for the Lord because, well, the, the kids got to get up early in the morning. Or maybe uh, we think about moving to uh, a faraway location for school because it's got a great program, but it doesn't have a good church situation. We need to... Uh, not rejoice in the works of our own hands, but rejoice in the works of the Lord, else we be found to have uh, idolatrous thinking. Stephen goes on to say in verse 42, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, and as, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacles of Moloch and the star of your god Rephan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Isn't that strange? They're in the wilderness with God in their midst, the Shekinah glory, and yet they were bowing down to these idols. But I think that this golden calf is particularly interesting, and Stephen does, does focus on that. And I think that's because it's the prototypical idol. It's the first idol that uh, Israel bowed down to and, and worshipped. And do you remember what it is they said about it when they made it? They said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, they didn't say, here is a brand new God that we're going to name. They didn't say, oh, look, we brought this God with us from Egypt, or we've, we're, we're taking this God from Canaan where we're going to go. No, they said, this is your God, O Israel, who has brought you out of the land of Egypt. They wanted to change God's character. They saw 
the glory of God on Mount Sinai, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 11 and 12, Moses reminds them, it says, uh, Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you in the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a, a voice. God was terrifying. God was powerful. And Israel didn't want that God. Israel didn't want a God that would hold them accountable and would uh, hold them to a standard. They wanted a God that they could manipulate and make their own standard. They wanted a God that, uh, instead of being made in the image of God, they could mold God into the image that they wanted. Uh, Remember um, in Exodus chapter 20, in fact, this is the very commandment where God said that they are not to make graven images for themselves. God describes his character. Uh, He says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, God had revealed himself to Israel. He He told them exactly what he was like, and they didn't like that. Now, sometimes don't we do that? Sometimes don't we want to serve a God who is all loving and all kind and all merciful and all forgiving and all understanding? We need to be careful that we're serving the God that has been revealed to us. And that's not just an Old Testament thing. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, Therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And John the Baptist He uh, described Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn and he will burn up the chaff with unquestionable fire. God is loving. God is kind. God is understanding. He is all those things. But we can't focus just on the aspects of God that we like or else we'll be just like Israel and fall into idolatrous thinking. Um, you know, in, uh, it's not just in the religious world where we, we see a problem with this thinking of uh, a changing God to the way that we want Him to be. We see this in politics as well. We, we have on our money, uh, in God we trust. Well, what does that mean? Who is God and who is we? Because if the we is the, the nation of the United States, then the God that we trust in is not the God of the Bible. He's the God who uh, looks after the interests of the United States. But in the church, if we is the church, then the God that we trust in should be the God who reveals himself in the Bible, whether that's convenient for us or not. Otherwise, we fall into idolatrous thinking. And while we're on the subject, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we give God the glory in politics as well and and not feel like we need to control things. Because don't you think that God can accomplish His will no matter who the president is or who the leader of uh, whatever country or who your local representative is? God can accomplish His will no matter uh, who is in control because He is sovereign and He is in control. Uh, So Israel had this problem with idolatry. They had it all through their history. One of the things that you often read in the Old Testament is this idea of stiff-necked. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 13, uh, Moses says to Israel, Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed they are a stiff-necked people. This is just before God uh, tells Moses, Get out of my way, I want to destroy them and make a nation out of you. Uh, They are a stiff-necked people. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a stiff-necked people? Well, what it means is that Israel had made this golden calf, and God is saying they have become what they worship. They have become what they worship. Now, the thing about a calf, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a, uh, an animal expert here. Uh, this is just from what I've read. Is it stubborn? It doesn't want to turn its neck. It doesn't want to be guided. Stiff neck means it wants to go where it wants to go. It doesn't want to, the, the, it doesn't want to be guided by those who know better. 
doesn't want to be guided by those who take care of it. And God is saying that Israel is just the same. It's stiff-necked. It wants to do what it wants to do. It doesn't want to be guided, doesn't want to be corrected, doesn't want to be led where God is leading it. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, uh, Moses pleads with Israel. He says, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Now Israel had in their bodies a sign of obedience to God. But Moses said, that's not enough. You need to be converted in your heart. Be wholly dedicated to the Lord. Otherwise, you're still back in idolatry. You need to uh, be stiff-necked no longer and circumcise your heart. Uh, Stephen closes his sermon very powerfully in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Uh, We'll read 51 through 53. He says, To the the Sanhedrin, the highest court in the land, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had foretold the the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. Now, here's the point. Here's the point that the Holy Spirit and Luke want us to get out of this story. Anyone who receives the Word of God and does not obey it is the same as an idolater. That's idolatry. So, we need to examine our own lives this evening. Examine us. I need to examine my life. You need to examine your life. Are you an idolater? Am I an idolater? If so, we need to circumcise our hearts, stiffen our necks no longer, make sure that we are wholly dedicated to God and serve Him, obey His commandments, no matter how inconvenient it may be, but be dedicated to Him. Thank you.